I just wanted to come in here with a quick note. During the recording of this episode, the recording failed, but instead of scrapping that question entirely, I decided to use my backup recording, which was the recording on my phone. So for that particular question, the recording quality is a lot worse. But at least you'll still be able to hear Kevin's answer to that particular question. Okay, on with the show. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of the Silly Linguistics Podcast. Today I have a special guest. I have Kevin Stroud here, who created the History of English Podcast. Okay, so tell us a little something about yourself. Hi, this is Kevin Stroud. I'm the host and presenter of the History of English Podcast. I've been putting it together now for... A little over four years. I am an attorney by profession. I'm not a linguist or an English scholar or an historian, but I love history. And uh, a few years ago, I decided to start doing the podcast and uh, still still doing it to this day, nearly five years later. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so where did you get the initial idea to create the podcast? Well, I was a fan of podcasting. I started listening back around 2009, 2010, and I was listening to a lot of different kinds of podcasts, but then I discovered history podcasting, and that was something that had always fascinated me. You know, as I said, my background was really more in law, but I had always been fascinated by history, and I decided that you know, that was something that I, I was interested in pursuing and thought about doing my own history podcast. It was just a matter of trying to decide what aspect of history I wanted to do. And I'd always been fascinated by the Indo-Europeans. And you know, the Indo-Europeans, as I'm sure most of your listeners know, is the, you know, the ancient linguistic group that gave birth to all of the modern languages of Europe, and well, almost all of the modern languages of Europe, and many of the languages of South Asia. So to me, that had always been a fascinating topic. I had learned about it in college, but I never seemed to come across it anywhere else. You know, I would read about or listen to histories of Egypt and Rome and, and Greece and you know, all these other cultures. No one ever seemed to talk about the Indo-Europeans. So I thought, well, that would be a great topic, a great idea for a podcast. And that's really where the idea began as the history of the Indo-Europeans. So how did the idea of the podcast from a podcast about the Indo-Europeans uh, turn into a podcast that was going to be just about the history of English? Well, I was thinking about the history of the Indo-Europeans is really the history of a linguistic group. So their language ultimately leads to you know, the Greek language, Sanskrit, Latin, the Germanic languages, Celtic languages, you know, Old Norse and Old English. And so I was thinking about it more and more in terms of language. And then English itself has borrowed so heavily from so many other languages that it seemed a, a logical solution to, to put it together and really to tell the story of not only the Indo-Europeans, but to tell it through the history of English. And as you're tracing the history of the Indo-Europeans through time, and of course their linguistic descendants, then you can pick out words that have entered English over time from those languages, from those cultures, and it, it makes a connection to the history that you don't normally have when you're just telling the history of a particular group of people or a particular you know nation, state, or culture. When you do it through the history of language, it, it has this immediate personal connection and so the more I thought about it, I realized that yeah, that's a good way to tell the story, is to tell it through the, the prism and perspective of English, since all of these cultures ultimately influence the development of English over time. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Um, that's part of the reason I got into uh, language myself, that um, I, would, I never felt that connected to my history or my heritage or anything. But uh, when I started looking into it, I was like, wait. I have ancestors that spoke Old English, and I have ancestors that spoke Proto-Indo-European, and, and that immediately made it more interesting for me. Um, and so that's how I got into language, just by realizing that connection and realizing that it, it, it was quite real for me. So you start out with, with Indo-European, and then obviously that then develops into Proto-Germanic, and that turns into Old English. Was that was it quite 
uh, tough for you, like learning old English and learning these things about Middle English and Proto Germanic and Proto Indo European because they're really different. I mean, we're talking about six thousand years about uh, of history and language change. It it was difficult, and as I've noted before, I'm I'm not an English scholar. I'm not a linguist. I'm not even an historian. I'm I'm really ultimately an attorney. That's what my background is in. So for me, it was really entering into a new area of study and research, and I wanted to take it seriously. So I'm an avid book collector, and over the years, I've collected hundreds and hundreds of books, and I've collected lots of books related to the history of English and etymology and the general history of language and linguistics. So I had a pretty good resource base to work from if I was just willing to make the commitment and and spend the time doing the research and trying to put it together. But it was definitely a challenge, and I I pull from a lot of different resources when I do the podcast. Uh, when it comes to Old English and you know Middle English, which were pronounced very differently, I've actually gone back and and tried to listen to other scholars who've done readings in those languages and tried to nail down as best I can how to pronounce those languages. And I've never uh, purported to be an expert or provide, you know, an exact reading of those languages, but to, but I've tried to get as, you know, as close as I can. And to me, that's one of the appeals of a podcast as opposed to just reading a book about it. The podcast really offers the opportunity to, present what it would have sounded like if you had heard Old English or Middle English. So I would really be missing that important step if I didn't make that commitment and, tr- and try to you know present that part of the story. So along the way, I've always tried to include readings in those languages or early versions of the languages as best I can. Okay, that, that, that's really cool because one, one thing that I really like about the podcast is when you do the actual readings of, of, of Old English because it's, it's strangely similar and also very different in some way to modern English. And so we're, when, when you hear it, 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 it's a bit like hearing your grandfather speak, you know, it's like, you know, you're, you're related, but it's very different as well. Right. Yeah, and you can pick out words, and that's the thing that really fascinates me is is when I listen to Old English, you know, 80 to 90 percent of it you can't really understand, but there's always that little bit that you can, and it's like trying to put together a puzzle, and of course, as you get into Middle English, <laughs> it becomes more like 50 percent that you can understand, and in late, late Middle English, it becomes 75 percent. So again, that's the fascination as you're going from the earliest English text, and I think the first one I read from was Ethelbert's Laws of Kent, which is the very or the oldest known document written in the English language. From there through Beowulf and then through some of the late Middle English text, and now we're in early Middle English, I think that that it's starting to become more familiar as I read them. I think it starts to sound a little bit more like English. But again, to me, for me, that's always been the fascinating part is trying to piece together this language that doesn't sound anything like English uh, and trying to connect it to modern English. Yes, yes. Um, uh, one of the things that, that I always love in, 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 when listening to Old English is you find a part that you can just understand. Uh, I think at the beginning of, of Beowulf, uh, one line is, that was good kuning. And, yeah, that's and that's a, almost yeah. entirely understandable to to your modern modern English. Yeah. Uh, that was a good king. It's one of the it's one of the famous little or well known little parts of Beowulf, and it's often referenced. But yeah, that that poem I actually ended up doing an entirely separate series dedicated to Beowulf because I wanted to really get into the poem and do a lot of readings. And I did do a regular episode related to Beowulf, but then. I thought, wow, this is such a fascinating story in and of itself. The the poem, where it came from, when was it written, how did it come about, and just digging through the story and, again, trying to make the connections to modern English. So I actually ended up doing an entirely separate little audio book related to Beowulf. Yes. Um, well, what, I, what I thought was really cool, and you you, you explained this point really well in, in the podcast, was how um, – it was already an oral culture back then, and and the the society that we live, the modern society now, it's 
people are the same, but society is very different, I, I think. Um, and so uh, talking about Be Beowulf, it was very interesting because you, you got a feel for how what place this uh, poem has in the culture and and how a lot of the references uh, in in the poem don't make sense to to uh, to uh, modern English uh, speakers because they don't have those cultural references and explaining those cultural references were, was very interesting. So this is really my ultimate connection to this story is language and culture. I mentioned I think I mentioned earlier that you know at some point I was exposed to the idea of the Indo-Europeans. I don't think I had ever heard anything about the Indo-Europeans until I was in college. And in college, I was taking a lot of courses in anthropology, which fascinated me, and particularly cultural anthropology, which is, of course, the study of cultures. And one of the courses I took was called Language and Culture. And it was the ultimate sort of connecting, you know, the, the, how language influences culture and culture influences language. And that was the course where I first really learned about the Indo-Europeans and so of all the courses I took in college, that one always stands out to me. And in many ways, that is the approach that I have in the podcast. Uh, that's sort of the connection I had when I thought about telling the story of the Indo-Europeans, as I mentioned earlier, is that ultimate connection between language and culture. It, you know, it's one thing to just tell the history of a word. If you go look up the word in the Oxford English Dictionary, you see it has Proto-Indo-European roots maybe pass through the Germanic languages and all that. But if you can put that into some historical context and you can explain why that word came into being and, and relate it to the culture of the period and then relate it to modern culture and see how the word has developed and evolved, to me, that's the fascinating part of the story. And to do it chronologically, which is what I try to do in the podcast, starting at the very beginning all the way up to modern period, then you really start to see the pieces come together and it starts to fit together like a puzzle. And uh, again, to me, that was really the ultimate basis you know, idea behind the podcast. Oh, that, that's really cool. Um, w one of the things that I uh, really liked it is, especially in the Proto-Indo-European section of the podcast, talking about words, um, how words uh, diverged into the uh, daughter languages like um, black is related to the the uh, French Blank word for white. Bleach and yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, so, and yeah. so, so, because uh, one of it comes from burn, which is bright, and the other comes from burnt, which is black. And so you have the two completely di different meanings, and it's fascinating yeah. to see how how much things change. Yeah, and another example of that is the words guest and host, which ultimately was one single word. And that reflects a different culture at the time. You know, the Indo-Europeans were, it's believed, were nomadic peoples. They were herders, so they were often moving around. And as tribes moved, they encountered each other, and, and one tribal group probably passed through lands that were occupied by a different group at the time. And so today's guest might be tomorrow's host. You know, it was two different aspects of the same thing. Yet over time, through linguistic developments, we have these two distinct words that have passed into English, guest and host, but they're ultimately cognate. They came from the same original source word. It's very interesting. Um, and, and just a thing about making a podcast itself, um, that what I've done with my podcast is I... Uh, I'm not very good at structuring my, that's one thing I'm not very good at. So, so for instance, with this podcast, I just get someone on and I talk to them. Um, <laughs> and, and so you seem to have the almost uh, opposite approach to me. Uh, but, but what, what's interesting about it is like how, like, I'm not good at managing that kind of thing, but for you, how do you, how do you balance uh, pure linguistic information and history and what history do you put in and, and stuff like that? I don't know if I have a good answer to that question because that's something I struggle with all the time. I, as I mentioned, I'm telling the chronological history of English and the ancestors of English. So to me, it's very important to to try to keep that in mind and structure the story in a way that it makes sense that the story develops because it sort of builds on itself. 
In the early episodes of the podcast, I introduced concepts like sound shifts. And then, you know, that builds on itself because over time, there are more sound shifts that come into play. And you're just kind of constantly building. And I think you, I almost think of it in terms of maybe an, an architect or an engineer. You know, you start at the foundation and then you work your way up. And you've got to make sure you've got a good foundation before you start adding the next level or the next story. So I'm always thinking about how to develop the story in, in a logical and consistent way, but also keeping the story interesting. You know, this is a topic that would be very easy for it to become dry and dull and boring. And that's one of the reasons why I don't get into many technical aspects here. I don't get into linguistics any more than I have to. I'm not a professional linguist. So I just touch on it when I feel like I need to. But the key is keeping it interesting. And again, that kind of goes back to the basic idea behind the podcast, which is mixing history, actual history, political, cultural history, with the development of the language, because that allows you to keep the story moving, keep it going, keep it interesting. If the language part starts to get a little dull, and I can kind of sense that as I'm put, putting together an episode, then I can sort of shift over to you know, some king who was trying to kill another king or something, you know, some historical development. And and it's a good way, I think, to keep the story balanced and interesting. So there's always this planning ahead. And at any given time, I when I do an episode, I've already kind of planned ahead at least four or five. And you know, when I began the podcast, I had planned out the first 25 or so episodes, pretty much everything from the earliest Indo-Europeans all the way up to Old English. That entire period, which covered the first year of the podcast, I pretty much had you know planned out ahead of time, so I knew where I was going to go with it. It's not to say that I don't have regrets. There are a few things I would definitely do you know differently if I was going to go back and redo it, but for the most part i'm I'm happy with it and pleased, and I think it it worked in terms of setting everything up for old English when I finally got there uh the, that that's cool um yeah, it it it's funny you mention about not not getting bogged down in in, in the details because um, uh, part of, part of my success I think is getting bogged down in the details because um <laughs> like uh, it, it's very interesting how our lives up until now have kind of affected our path because you like uh, an attorney so I think you you work with words and like what do words mean and stuff and and for me I. I'm a programmer by trade, and that's what I studied at, at at university. And so that's the approach that I take to language. I go in there and I say, this is how the system works. This is an agglutinative language. This is a, this kind of language. I explain those things, but what I do is I explain it in an accessible way. I say, kind of like, um, I think the most linguistic, linguistic -y thing that you ever did was talking about assimilation. And you were saying, well, but 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 it, it was it was interesting that that um, you, you you put a lot of pressures on, like, what? Well, don't worry if you didn't understand that, you know. <laughs> and, and I, I almost I almost always say that anytime I mention something technical, I usually conclude by saying, it's not important if you don't really re remember that, because what I'm trying to do is. I think about any time I prepare an episode, who is my audience, and I have my my. I always assume that the typical listener is someone that has no knowledge of anything I'm talking about. And I occasionally get feedback from parents who tell me that their children, sometimes very young children, love listening to the podcast. So that also kind of figures into how I prepare an episode. If I was going to explain these things to someone who was – to a small child, so to my daughter who's 10 years old, how would I explain this to her? And I really – think that if I can do that, then I think anybody can can do it. I try not to talk down to anybody because I'm coming at it from the same perspective that a lot of listeners are. Again, that's this is not my, you know, my scholarly background at all. So a lot of this I'm learning for the first time and presenting it. I think of myself a lot of times as kind of a journalist or a reporter. You know, I've done the research. This is what I discovered and hey everybody, I'm gonna tell you about what I just learned. And so I'm just thinking, approaching it from that perspective. Oh, that, 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 that's very cool. So uh, you, you mentioned about how much planning goes into it. Like, how, how did that planning work? Did, did you say to yourself, okay, there's going to be so many episodes about Old English, so many episodes about Proto-Indo-European, so many episodes about Proto-Germanic, so many episodes about Middle English. And also, 
we we all know what happened in ten sixty six. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> and and yeah. we, we 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 all know about Shakespeare. You know, so all these things we know already. But now, um, when you're going through the podcast, you think to yourself, oh, okay, this thing is going to come up, and and it's very interesting to see how how you how you deal with that. But when you when you're when you're making the podcast, do you have that in the back of your back of your mind? Your story is developing in this way. Um, and then you think you're like, oh crap, ten c c six is coming up. It's gonna ruin the story. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's the first part of the question was, did I have a, an overall scope or plan or idea for the podcast? And yes. And I actually mentioned this in one episode, and I found that a lot of listeners are kind of holding me to it. But originally, I had the idea of covering the entire history in one hundred episodes with about 25 dedicated to the period before Old English, pre-English is what I called it, and then about 25 episodes dedicated to Old English, and then 25 to Middle English, and then 25 to Modern English. Well, I stayed pretty close to that goal through the pre-English period, but once I got into Old English, I found that there was a lot more there than I realized. As I started digging into it, initially I thought, how am I going to do 25 episodes on Old English? You know, I, I don't know how I'm going to do that. And once I got into it, I realized I could have done 50 episodes on Old English. So I, at some point, I had to start editing myself and, and, and not get too bogged down and not go down too many rabbit holes. But yeah, that's it, it, now I'm completely off course. In fact, I, I mentioned in the most recent episode I did that the, the hundred episode idea is out the window because I'm still in early Middle English and I'm almost at a hundred episodes. So yeah, it's, I'm just kind of letting it take its course. But there are those landmark periods. You you know in the pre English period that you're leading up to the the conquest of Britain by the Anglo Saxons, and you know in the Old English period you're leading up to the Norman conquest. And and now I know I'm leading up to, you know, the great vowel shift and you know, the expansion of English around the world. And so I'm always I always have that in the back of my mind. But I try not to be too predictable in terms of where the story is going. And I try to keep it interesting if I can. Yeah, uh, that's cool. Um, and and one thing I've, I've noticed, it took me a while to, to notice this because I was, you know, just taking in the story. But um Every now and again, you have themes like uh, I think the latest episode that I've been listening to is one about broken promises and how you bring up all these broken promises. Is uh, uh, do those themes just come to you as you're working through the material and you're like, wait a moment, something seemed to be coming up again and again and again? Because uh, I find that that would be something that I wouldn't be able to do because I'm very good at explaining systems, but I'm not really. Right. Right. Uh, I wouldn't be able to say, okay, well this. Podcast. This episode is about uh, broken promises or something, right? So I mentioned earlier that I, I'm generally pleased with the first twenty five or thirty episodes related to pre English, but there are a few things that I would do differently. That's that idea of developing an episode around a theme and then relating it back to the language and the historical developments was really something I I came up with in old when I got into the old English period. And I was thinking about, as I said earlier, how am I going to do 25 episodes on Old English? You know, this is just – it's just words. It's some linguistic developments. Of course, there's a lot of political history here. How do I make all this make sense? And as I got into it, I realized, oh, I kind of had this little insight. What I can do is look at the historical developments, look at the linguistic developments – and try to connect them around a certain theme. So if the particular developments involved, as you said, broken promises or, or deals or contracts, I can use those historical developments as a basis for looking at etymology. So we can look at the Old English words related to that and try to connect it together. And that's really sort of an insight I didn't have until I got into the Old English period and once I developed that idea, then I felt like I was good to go. I knew at that point how I could cover the rest of the Old English period. The tricky part is trying to identify the themes and put it together and make it make sense. And that's just a matter of doing the research and looking through it and just trying to come up with a good story. Ultimately, I think a good podcast, particularly a good history podcast, is about storytelling. You got to tell a story. And that's why I wanted to do it chronologically chronologically. 
And so to me, the idea of using a theme as a jumping off point is just a way of telling a good story. Cool, cool. Um, th that's one thing I've, I've realized is that um, I'm really good at talking about systems. Um, I got into programming because uh, I'm, I'm very interested in, in how these things work and stuff. And so whenever I find a good, good system or, or, or a good um, cognate to tell an interesting story, I mean, I, I, I learned a while ago that, that um, the word Mary is ultimately con uh, cognate with the word bra, but in completely roundabout mm -hmm. ways, uh, mm -hmm. Mary is, is short and then a bra, it, it, um, the, the word bra got its name because it, it was something worn on the, on the chest. <laughs> um, uh, and, and something that was also worn on the chest um, was, was named after the arm for some reason, um, and then the, the arm got its name because it was short. So, so the, mm. the 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 upper arm is shorter than than the lower arm. So, so you have these crazy different words, and but they actually are ultimately related. And and so I wrote this long post on my website talking talking about uh, those connections. Um. So so I've I've got a completely different uh, uh focus in 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 my podcast and in in, in my work. Well, there are, there are a lot of good books that have that theme: etymology books, uh, books about you know doublets and, and different words that are ultimately related, but you would never realize it. And that was, again, one of the things that fascinated me. But in looking through etymology books, the words are, you know, a discussion about the words you just mentioned, for example, uh, would cover a, a chapter or a few pages. And then you've got another chapter on some completely different set of words. And my idea in the podcast was to take all those interesting bits and pieces of etymology and structure them in a chronological way so that you can do what you just said. Look at the historical connections between words that you did not know were related, but do it in a, in a chronological historical narrative. And that helps you actually see how the words developed over time. You can see where the original version of the word, you know, that might have been used in Old English or in Proto Indo European. And then use that as the jumping off point to trace out the differences over time and then bring it back to the narrative. And it, it helps provide some context for that. Yes, yes. Um, one one thing I, I notice about your podcast is that what I always love doing is whenever I find a cool word, I would say, oh, well, this word is related to this word in German. So so because it it started out as me thinking like English is so weird and because of the bloody Normans and stuff, you know, English is so different to the to the other, other Germanic languages. And the more I've looked into it, the more I've realized that that English actually is very Germanic. And and there's there's mm -hmm. a lot of words like the word "read" is related to the German "rat," you know, because "read" used to right. be. Um, I think you mentioned that in the podcast as well. And like "read" meant council, like uh, uh, "ethelred done ready." Um, ready, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, but but I, I notice you you don't. Um, talk a lot about other Germanic cognates like oh by the way this this word is cognate with this in German and this in Swedish is that just to not get people bogged down and maybe a bit confused and like you just throwing too much facts at them it, partly it's also because I don't really have a, excuse me I don't really have a background in German or Dutch or Scandinavian languages my other linguistic background is really in French which was the language I had studied for many years in college. And I also studied, actually studied Mandarin uh, Chinese for a while, for a year or two. But I never really studied German or the other Germanic languages. So I, a lot of times I just can't make those connections. Oh, okay. <laughs> and after I do an episode, after I do an episode, I will almost inevitably get feedback from listeners, particularly during the Old English period. I would get feedback from listeners uh, who were, you know, native German or Dutch or, again, other Germanic speakers would write me long emails about, oh, you know, this word is connected to this word. And, oh, I didn't never realize that, you know, this English word was related to this word. And I'm like, well, you know, it doesn't do me a lot of good now that I've already done the episode. <laughs> but it's great that, to, you know, to have that information. And I've actually thought about at some point maybe trying to do a little bit of study in in German or one of the other languages and, and try to explore that a little bit further. But I also realize that most listeners don't have that linguistic background. 
And it's so easy to get off course with this kind of topic and start following, again, all these little rabbit holes that I realize after a while it's it's great that people see that and can discover that on their own. But if I tried to go through you know, all those words, it, it would just be you know, a never-ending story. So it's probably better that I don't have that background. <laughs> uh, well, what was interesting for me, I, I think I, I'm coming at it from a completely different point of view because I think because of my like academic background, I have a master's in computer science, and and so I spent many many years at university. And so uh, when I joined the language community in twenty fourteen, uh, I immediately saw the 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 academic side of it, you know, and they've got these complex theories and how these systems work, and these systems get get very complicated, um, and and so I I very quickly became what you can call like a language nerd. Um, and so we're, 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 I can I can make these jokes on my page, and people are like ah, oh, you know. But like only only these language people get it. But but w- what what's funny is I'm actually making this language knowledge more accessible to more people out there because um, I even explain terms like what does cognate mean and what is the uh, mm. laryngeal theory and you know all, all this stuff. So so I'm coming in from from a different point of view, and and it's very interesting that that you come in from the more narrative point of view, and I come in more systems point of view but i think we're both making this uh we're both trying to make this uh, material more accessible yeah yeah it's it's a it's a fascinating topic i can only approach it from my own perspective and i try to do it in a broad enough way that you know, many, many different people will hopefully find it interesting and, and with different backgrounds and i get a lot of feedback from people like yourself and you know a lot of listeners with technical backgrounds that know absolutely nothing about english who say they enjoy the podcast and find it interesting. And, and that's one of the most satisfying things for me is the fact that I'm not just doing a podcast for language nerds or history nerds. You know, I'm one of those nerds myself, but but the the audience is broader than that, hopefully. And I, I, I get a lot of feedback. And again, as a, for me, it's partly because I have to be honest, when I was in school, I did not like English class. It was one of my least favorite classes. I I had very little interest in reading fiction. I I love nonfiction. I love history, but wasn't a big fiction reader. I hated diagramming sentences. There's just nothing that appealed to me about it. So it's interesting. I'm doing a podcast about the history of English, but to me, the history of the language is very fascinating as opposed to you know, the, the technical aspects of it. So I think I'm able maybe to make that connection because I'm like a lot of other people that, that didn't really relate to English. In fact, when I was in, in high school and college, I was really more a math and science guy myself. It's sort of interesting. I went into law and now doing a history of English podcast, but I, you know, I, I always did better in my math and science courses and found it more, you know, found those to be easier than my English courses. But, you know, it, it ultimately, you know, I, I ended up here, so th- there maybe there was a purpose. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's very funny you, you you mentioned that because I was exactly the same. Um, I did not do well in English, and I I didn't like it, and it actually caught me by surprise. It makes a lot of sense in hindsight, but at the time, I was like, why why is this page getting so so popular? And, you know, like I'm just writing all this stuff about language, um, and, mm-hmm. and, 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 and people, people really who on to it. What, what's interesting about my background is that, um, so I, I grew up in Cape Town in South Africa, which, which is, um, uh, where, where the British landed like many, many centuries ago. Right. And, and right. so to this day, it's still got the highest proportion of uh, native English speakers. And so English is my, is my native language. Um, and my, my mother's uh, of English descent, but my dad's German. He was born in mm. Germany. Um, and mm-hmm. so I didn't speak German while, while I was growing up, uh, but I did hear it a lot. And so when I eventually learned it at, at, at university, um, and then continued after that. Um, it it came it came to me quite quite quickly, um, and and it's so w- whenever I, I I hear these words, you know, I think, oh, that that reminds me of this word. Like for instance, the the other English word Niemann um, is related to German Nehmen, and so all the English hmm. it's been, it, very much so in the beginning was pretty much just a German dialect, and then it diverged more and more and more over time. Well, I find it interesting when people contact me who, uh, particularly Dutch speakers, uh, 
who tell me that they've read Beowulf in the original Old English and or tried to read it, and they can actually understand large sections of it, whereas a modern English speaker would be able to understand very little at all, you know, trying to read it in the original Old English. And and, and it makes sense if you know the history, because Old English at that point in time and in its development was much closer to, you know, the what would have eventually merged into to Dutch. And even today, Old English probably has more in common with Dutch than it does modern English. I mean, about 80, about 85 percent of the vocabulary of Old English has been lost and it's been replaced with French, Latin, Greek and other words. You know, English loves to borrow words and it's pushed out a lot of its native original Germanic uh, native vocabulary. So that makes it very challenging. You mentioned Niemann, you know, words like that that have disappeared from the language. But a lot of them do survive and they survive in very interesting ways. And if you can show people a way in which a particular word survives, uh, Niemann, for example, it, it, the word for take uh, has been replaced by the Norse word take. But Niemann still survives in the word nimble if someone is quick. Uh, you kind of take and run. So it, these words do survive in funny ways. They don't always have the same meaning and they don't always look like the original version of the word. But that's fascinating to go back and, and look at an old English text and pick out the words and say, you know, we still actually have this word and this is how we use it today. Yes, um, that, that's one thing I, I, I love highlighting on, on my page. Well, what I'll do is I'll find, I'll find a word and then like, like you mentioned on, on your podcast about with, like withdraw and withhold is actually mm -hmm. uh, against, and that's what with used mm -hmm. to mean. Because um, in in German and in so many um, Germanic languages, it's mit in um, Swedish and it's mit in in German, and and it was mid in Old English. It's like where does with right. come from? Just popped out uh, out of nowhere, um, and then you actually see oh that uh, that the connection is still there. In the language, yeah, the connect, ultimate closeness and connection, yeah, and and at the current point we are in the story of English, which is early Middle English, uh, mid was still being used, but it's slowly disappearing from the language in early Middle English in that context. But again, still survives in a word like middle, so you know it's still there. It's just used in a slightly different way. Yes, uh, so uh, let me just talk a, a, a bit about like. How, how how can you say the business slash behind the scene kind of thing? Like, how how did you publicize the the podcast and and what was the process like? Learning how to make a podcast and posting it on, online and advertising it and stuff like that. Well, I started it back in two thousand eleven, two thousand twelve. So at the time, podcasting was established, but it wasn't as big as it's become in recent years. So there weren't as many resources. And I just, it's a matter of like anything else, you kind of research it, look online and try to figure out how to put it together. So I don't even really remember <laughs> much about it. I mean, at the time I, there were, there were services online that hosted podcasts and I used one of those originally. And then ultimately I got a little more sophisticated and established my own separate site and moved everything over so that I now have complete control over it. And were I to, to start a, a new podcast or do it all over again, I would do that rather than trying to transfer everything over and reconfigure it. But it's a, it's a learning experience. It's trial and error. But I finally figured it out, got it up and running. As far as the promotion of it, I'm a horrible promoter. I, I really don't. I just kind of let it speak for itself. It's out there. I will say very early on, I, um, one of the slate podcast, the culture podcast mentioned it and recommended it. And I'd only done maybe, I don't know, six or seven episodes at the time, but that slate podcast had a very big audience. And uh, almost overnight, I attracted a lot of listeners who subscribed. And then from there, the message just spreads. And over time, you know, other resources, other podcasts have recommended it. And you know, every time that happens, you just gain new listeners and it, it builds on itself. And, you know, now, as I said, four and a half years or so in, I have a, a pretty nice size audience. Uh, 
and they're very interactive. They email me, they follow up with me, and I try to interact with them as much as I can. But I think, you know, over time, it's just a matter of, of staying committed, maintaining a regular schedule, trying to maintain as high a standard as you can. And over time, I think the audience will grow. Yes, yes. Um, that, that's what happened with me on, on my page. Um, it took me about uh, 10 months to reach 500 likes. And I've since gone on, gone on to get over 30,000. So uh, that, that initial period of just, um, you just got to do it every day. I would post something and I'd get no comments for months and months and months. And then every now and then, oh, I really like this post. And you go, yes. <laughs> um, and, 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 and then um, it, it's just been growing crazy. Now every single post that, uh, that, that I do, I, I get comments and, and it, it, it's so nice uh, to get that. Uh, what, did it feel like that for you? Did, did it feel like you were putting it out and like into a void and it just seemed like nothing was happening for it for a long time? I I never I never really had that experience. I, f- I have to say that I began doing the podcast with absolutely no goal or intention in mind other than just doing a podcast. And and I think that was the right attitude to have. As I said earlier, it was a topic that fascinated me. I had never really heard it told in this way. It wasn't like I was retelling a story I had already heard a thousand times. And I thought, well, you know, this is something that I'm, I'm interested in it. I'm, I want to learn about it. I want to present it. If a hundred people like it, that's cool. If a hundred thousand people like it, that's cool too. But I had no plans of doing it as a job or as a profession or making money or trying to become well known. It's just, I just thought it was interesting. That's what fascinated me about podcasts when I listen to podcasting. It's just basically normal people talking about things that fascinated them or interested them. And so that was the whole idea. And over time, as the audience grew, you know, I started to take it more seriously. And, and these days, I pretty much divide my time, uh, about 50% dedicated to podcasting and about 50% dedicated to my, my, my law practice. I, I moved a year or two ago, so I'm not in the same town that I was in. And so I, I still maintain my law practice, but I don't, I'm not able to dedicate as much time to it as I was. So I've kind of replaced that with some of the the time I spend podcasting. But ultimately today it's about 50-50 split between those two. Uh, Okay. Did you at one point do the nine to five, five days a week uh, at the law firm and and you transitioned to a more flexible schedule? Yeah. And and my law practice was is my practice. So I had flexibility there and, and always have. But yeah, I was full time attorney. I only did the podcast in in spare time, and as I mentioned, I had prepared the first year or so of the research and episodes before I ever started, and that allowed me. Once I began, I was able to maintain a regular schedule. Every couple of weeks, I was able to produce an episode because I had already done the research. It was just a matter of sitting down, organizing my thoughts, recording, and editing. At some point, though, along the way, <laughs> when I got into the old English period. I caught up to my research and then I, things started to slow down a bit because now every time I had to actually do research and, and of course the research builds on itself. Even when, now when I'm researching it, it's, it'll be relevant for many episodes down the road, but, but yeah, now I'm doing spending more time researching than I was initially just to be able to you know maintain a regular schedule. And it's more of a time commitment now uh, had I had I not scaled back my law practice, I would not be able to maintain the podcasting schedule. I would only be doing it. I might do an episode every six weeks instead of every three weeks like I do now. But again, I've been able to kind of reconfigure it. And, and I at some point within the last year for the first time, I uh, asked listeners to you know kind of join in and help out a little bit through uh, the I use Patreon and I provide some bonus content there. But the basic idea was to help me maintain that schedule by kind of offsetting the cost since I'm spending so much more time doing the podcast. But that's just a, something that goes with podcasting because eventually if the more you do it over time, it's going to require more time, more expense. A lot of people don't realize that the cost goes up over time because if you have a few listeners, the the – Hosting of the website and the audio files is not as expensive, but once you have lots and lots of listeners downloading it, accessing your website, you got to increase your hosting, you got to increase uh, 
you know, your, your audio you know, hosting plans and it just becomes more and more expensive. And, you know, that's the thing. At some point, there is a breaking point where you have to say to listeners, if you if you like what I'm doing and I, you want me to keep doing it, I might need a little bit of help here. And what I found is, is that people are very generous in that regard. I'm surprised, but so many people did join in and say, absolutely, it's a small commitment for what you provide, and I'm happy to do it. But, yeah, at some point you have to do that, and, and that's ultimately what I had to do. Okay. And and one thing that, that I've had to deal with, um, I, I suppose, in a, a similar situation to you, it, like we've been doing this other thing our whole lives, and here comes language, and, and it suddenly becomes a, bit, a big part of your life. Has that been a, a bit of a, a transition for you? Well, as I said, I, I it has been, and I feel like today, you know, I spend a lot of time researching English and history, and I start to think of myself increasingly as, you know, a historian, and I never really thought of myself as that before, but uh, but I, the way I think of myself and identify myself has started to change because if anyone had asked me four years ago, what do you do? I would say, well, I'm an attorney. If they ask me now, I kind of have to say, well, I'm, I'm a podcaster slash attorney. You know, I, I do podcasting. I probably spend more time on podcasting these days than I do on law, uh, just because of the commitment that I have to make to the podcast in terms of research. But yeah, I mean, it, it changes you know, so much about the way you, not only what you do on a day-to-day basis, but the way you identify and the way you think about yourself and, and, you know, what it is and what you do. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, because I was at the dentist and, and they asked me profession and I just wrote down programmer. At some point, I'm going to have to change that to um, <laughs> r- runs a website or something. <laughs> Well, I still get people who say, and I used to never really tell anybody that. Because like I said, to me, it was just a hobby. It was just something I did on the side. And increasingly, you know, now my, my wife tells everybody about it. My child, as I said, who's 10 years old, she kind of tells everybody. So now people come back and everybody knows I do it. And, and of course, you still have people who say, what's a podcast? And I can explain <laughs> that. But, uh, but increasingly, as I said, the, the more people that come to me, and ask me about podcasting, you know, no one ever used to do that. Now a lot of people do. And so, yeah. So these days I kind of increasingly think of myself as a podcast or whatever that is. And I guess I'm, that's what I am. Couldn't, Cause it's very cool. I, I don't think any of this would have been impossible back in the day because um, things have changed so, uh, so much so quickly. Like I got my start because of Facebook. I just started this thing on Facebook and I grew from there and and I've been able to to build things up nicely to to the point that uh, I will at some point be able to um, do this full time. I'm not doing it full time, but I'm doing it most of the time uh, at the moment. And eventually, I'll get to full time. And and that's all because of the internet and and the kind of democratization of content and 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 stuff like that. Um, and it's very interesting that like I came from the very different world where it's like you get paid a salary and you go sit in the office, and now. If I don't do stuff for my website and my page, that's fine. I mean, like, the, I'm not going to get fired or whatever, but it's a completely different way of, uh, of thinking about it. Like, I'm on all the time, you know, and I'm thinking about stuff. Uh, you, you find that that, hap- that happens to you as well? You, you've got it in the back of your mind all the time? Yeah, I do. I do, absolutely. Because like I said, I, I, whenever I have a few spare moments, I'm usually picking up a book and reading and, and doing research. And for me, it, it's not really a job. I enjoy it. I love reading. Yes, I love yes. reading about history and, and putting it putting it together, putting the podcast together to, for me is, is mostly fun. It's enjoyable and it's fun 80 to 90% of the time. Yes. Another 10, 15 percent, you know, it can be annoying. We have technical <laughs> issues or whatever, yes. whatever's going on. But most of the time, it's enjoyable. And I don't think I ever had that same experience practicing law. Uh, law was, a, <clears throat> excuse me, it was a, it was a job. At times, I enjoyed it. At times, I, I did not enjoy it at all. But I think that's the nature of practicing law, though. Yes, and, of and as I said, I've gone from maybe more. 50-50 good versus bad practicing law to you know ninety ten in terms of good versus bad in podcasting. Yes. But I have people ask me, you know, I, and, and I like to tell the story of English the way I am. It's a chronological story. So sometimes people say, well, what are you going to do when you get to the end? Because at some point you're going to get to the end of the story. Are you going to keep podcasting? 
And if you, again, if you'd asked me that a couple of years ago, I'd have probably said no. I had an idea. I was going to tell a story in 100 episodes. When I was done, I was done. Yes. Now it's become more of a commitment and a job. And so, yeah, I probably will. I'll do something else. And I already have some ideas in mind. So when, when this is done, I'll probably do something related, but, but slightly different. So what has the growth of the, of the podcast been, been like? Has it, has it been steady? Has it been a bit rocky? Has it been... Like rocketing up, uh, uh, how's that been for you? It's been steady. It's very difficult to get a good handle on statistics and exactly who's listening. But looking at the statistics I have available, I would say that the growth has been very consistent over time. And uh, you know, I haven't really seen any period when it's declined or leveled off. At times, it grows a little bit faster when someone recommends it. And, you know, you start to bring in a lot of new listeners kind of in a bunch uh, and it'll spike a little bit. But but over time, it's kind of like the the stock market, you know, it kind of has its little peaks and valleys a little bit. But over time, it's been kind of slow and steady growth. Cool, cool. Um, and and, and uh, uh, you mentioned before uh, that when you were finished with this, you, you were you were going to you're going to do something else like um do you, do you have any kind of ideas of what general topics you, you're going to cover? Are you are you mostly just going to do history, or, or are you going to do other things like language and culture, or like my my, my show? I, I touch on all sorts of topics. Like ba- basically, my my page is fun and interesting language content. So I just go all all over the place. Well, it's interesting. I've given it some thought and. I think that if I do another podcast after this one, it will relate in some way to law because that's really what my background is in. And I'm thinking of it more in terms of a history of law, kind of like I've done the history of English, maybe do a history of law, maybe not in a chronological way, because I don't know that you can tell the story of law in quite the same way. But there's a lot of interesting stories. I recently did an episode of the podcast about uh, the the legal developments that took place during the reign of Henry II. And most of the English or much of the English common law system can be traced back to developments that he instituted during his reign. And that was kind of an opportunity for me to experiment with the idea a little bit. And I, I was pretty, I was, I was happy with the episode. I thought it came out pretty well. But I know a lot of people who listen to my current podcast are fascinated by language so I think that if I do a podcast on the history of law, it'll have a language component to it as well. And maybe maybe kind of use that as a jumping off point but or try to blend it together in some way. But I do think that it'll have some kind of a legal um, angle to it whenever I get there. And that could be, you know, at the rate I'm telling the history of English, I might be an old, old man by the time I get to that point. <laughs> and just as a, as a last question, have you ever been interested in doing other types of media, um, YouTube, movies, in anything like that? Not really. I've had a few uh, listeners suggest doing YouTube videos, and I just haven't done that. I haven't had the time uh, to spend on that, and I just haven't made the commitment to it. I don't think I'm particularly photogenic. Uh, my, 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 my best feature is probably, if I have one, is maybe my, my voice, and it's not the best in the world, but I think people would rather listen to me than look at me. So uh, I don't I don't really anticipate doing video anytime soon. I think I'm going to stick with audio for a while. Okay, fair enough. Um, well, well I, I think we've covered a, a lot of topics here. Is there any last thing you, you would like to say to you, my listeners? Well, I just want to invite any of your listeners that haven't checked out the podcast to, to do that. I think if you have an interest in in linguistics or language or history. I think there's something there for everybody. I would recommend starting at the beginning. It is a chronological history and it does kind of build on itself. So I would invite uh, anyone that hasn't listened to come and listen. And if you have been listening to it, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, I hope I'm uh, around and able to make a, a lot more episodes all the way through the history of modern English. All right, cool. Well, well, that's about it for this episode. Don't forget to check out sillylinguistics.com and Silly Linguistics on Facebook. Cheers, guys. Bye.